Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share our, some of the uh, experiences with the uh, Apparent Scale Initiative on Vertical Subsurface Flow Constructed Wetland Systems, uh, particularly which we designed as a, a, a solution to the modern day STP, STPs. Um, because uh, these seem to be very low cost and environmentally, environmentally sustainable solutions widely practiced in America and Europe but not in the developing countries like India. So we thought that why not we establish one pilot scale uh, treatment system and show, demonstrate it to the people that uh, how far this technology is feasible and whether these uh, technology treated waste waters can actually be used for irrigation purposes. If so, uh, how do they compare with business as usual uh, you know, scenario? So this is just a uh, small uh, you know, presentation which I have prepared for all of you. We all know, uh, just uh, to set the scene, we know that water is a medium of origin, development and sustainability of life and civilization. We also know that the world is thirsty and that one in three people are already having water shortage. And as regards fresh water availability, we all already heard during the plenary session that uh, we are on a decline and we are uh, fast approaching the water scarce level of about 1,000 cubic meter per capita per annum by 2050. Uh, on the contrary, the sectoral water demand is on an ever increase. And uh, we also know that water is the most wasted resource uh, that also we heard in the plenary, there are a lot of leakages right from the source to the uh, supply end. And India leads that uh, in wastewater generation. And if you look at the statistics, out of the total wastewater generated, only 30 person is actually subjected to treatment, but is not actually treated. And what is treated is only between 10 to 20 percent. So under this scenario, recycle and reuse of wastewater seems to be the most viable option. And uh, we already heard many of our speakers and also during the plenary session that there are a number of conventional wastewater treatment methods. However, these are costly, unsustainable, generate hazardous sludge. These are not uh, revenue, uh, uh, revenue generating options and therefore not very uh, lucrative for uh, the, the people to continue with such system and also they are very high uh, skilled uh, labor demanding systems because of which uh, often these systems collapse and they are not at all sustainable. Uh, under these conditions, constructed wetland systems, which are nothing but the engineered swamplands or the engineered wetlands, <coughs> what you call as marshlands, these seem to be the most viable options. The, as you can see, these systems comprise of the wetland vegetation, the soil or the, or the gravel media, and the microorganisms. The three of them together integrate in the presence of the solar radiation to naturally treat the wastewaters. Right? So these seem to be the most uh, uh, feasible, decentralized, as we are often talking at various foras and platforms, that now that the pollutants are spread all over, we cannot be stuck with an idea of centralized wastewater. <coughs> we have to be decentralized now. So these seem to be the viable options for decentralized wastewater. So keeping these things in background, we developed a pilot plan of 1,500 liters per day capacity at the sewage plot site of Indian Agriculture Research Institute. Mind you, these are the lands which were continuously irrigated with the municipal sewage waters within the IRE watershed mm -hmm. boundaries. And these are also called our seed production unit farms. Mm -hmm. So we were using these farms of producing seed and then selling those seed to the nearby NCR region farmers. So we chose this particular area because this uh, served as a very you know, good platform to compare with the business as usual scenario. And the channel which you are seeing here is the sewage channel. So what we did, we, we bypassed this sewage uh, uh, from this channel uh, into a sump and then we spun this water into these nasal persons. So since it was a pilot plan, we uh, uh, initially had a couple of questions that whether the uh, wetland vegetation which is available under tropical conditions uh, and that too the ones which are most uh, have got some economic benefit because we wanted to close the loop because had we just finished uh, with the wetland vegetation any XYZ and said that okay this is the level of treatment 
Then the next question which would, which would have been fired on us is that what do we do with the vegetation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those all things are already there in the loop and in our mind. So uh, for the time being, we, we choose, particularly chose those veteran vegetation which have got some economic use. Like taifa, fragments, uh, and aquarius calamus. Aquarius calamus has got medicinal values. It uh, often is used uh, in black water, you know, to do, to do flatulency. And also the roots uh, or the rhizome of this uh, Aquarius calamus can be kept in the gully bags containing rice seeds and that keeps the pest away because of its aromatic, <coughs> because of its aroma. Also the Typha and Phragmites, they can be used for mat making, thatch, thatching and uh, roof making, rope making, a number of, you know, business and also of course biogas generation is also one of the options. So that was the thing in the background. And as you can see, these uh, uh, mesoposms, they comprise of three veteran vegetations, typha, pragmites, echodus calamus, and one mesoposm was left as such unplanted. Because literature says that the veteran vegetation, there, is, there are contradictions. Some say that the vegetation doesn't have a major role to play. Some say it does. So we we get one mesoposm without veteran vegetation. But over the time, it, it got inhabited with natural algal, filamentous algal species. So we cannot say it is unplanted, but it, you can say it, it is having floating macrophytes. So, so now the comparison is between the emergent and the floating macrophytes, how they have been again in the system, which particular system performs better and to what degree. And simultaneously, if you look at the left hand side of uh, this uh, area, there are certain microplots. We cannot see them very clearly in this particular picture. We, so after treating, we did an impact assessment study also. The what if these treated waters are uh, applied for irrigation in a paddy, wheat paddy system because that's the most dominant cropping practice over India. So what happens to the uh, agricultural land over the long term? What happens to the yields? What happens to the food grain quality and contamination levels? Now let's first of all see what is the pollutant uh, reduction efficiency of this pilot treatment. If you look at the turbidity levels, you can see um, over the first year we found that an <coughs> overall system pollution turbidity uh, removal reduction efficiency was about 72 percent, with the uh, uh, typha leading the rest of the system. TDS. Turbidity. 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 How did you measure turbidity? Uh, through a fellow meter. It's, it's an inbuilt electronic system. So yeah, you just yeah. read the water and it will give you the reading. Yeah. So uh, here I would like to specify. Why do you look at turbidity? To look at how much you can settle on the water. How much you can settle on the water. That also has a lot of settling. And most of the pollutants, they are only exchange sites on the setting. Very important. Now, here I would like to mention that this system is in operation since November 2009, and we purposefully left it as such because we wanted to see if we leave it unmanaged, does it impact the pollutant pollution reduction efficiency of the system or not? If yes, then what should the harvesting plan? At what frequency we should be harvesting, which are not a very time-consuming and a major management and you know, task. Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, if we divide the uh, period of monitoring into two years, as far as turbidity reduction efficiency is concerned, there was not much reduction. So we can say, though it started with 80-90 percent uh, pollution redu turbidity reduction efficiency, but on an average, over two years, it is about 71 percent reduction <coughs> Then coming to nitro reduction efficiency, similarly, we found that uh, initially, it was about 86 percent with Typha Fragmites based system and more so in the Fragmites based system. And but if you leave the system unharvested, there is a 30 percent reduction, 30 36 percent reduction in the overall you know, uh, nitro reduction efficiency of 68 percent. Uh, as regards phosphate reduction efficiency, it was as you can again see in the initial stage, it was about 80 82 percent but it eventually declined and overall average came out to be about 48 percent. Again, if you leave the system as such, there will be a reduction. So it's definitely important to harvest these plants uh, after every say six monthly before the monsoon, onset of the monsoon, so that uh, whatever is collected in the rhizome of the plants is redistributed to the upper plant parts and so that the rhizome is empty to take some more pollutants into it. 
then as regards potassium, the overall pollution reduction efficiency, if you see, it was a uh, date between 43 to 51 with an average of 47. This clearly shows that uh, the uh, that that it's it's not age specific pollution potassium reduction efficiency. And if you again compare between the floating macrophyte and the emergent macrophyte, the emergent macrophyte seems to be doing a better job than the floating macrophytes, but particularly with respect to the potassium reduction efficiency. Then sulfate reduction efficiency, that again seems to be unchanged uh, with the, the year, which clearly shows that the, it is not a plant-mediated reduction process. It is more of a soil and microbe mediated process. Plants are just the channels to take that sulfur dioxide out of the system. So it's not the plant which are the key players, but the soil and the microbes which are playing the key player. We also went ahead and assessed the metal removal efficiency, and that was in terms of iron, chromium, nickel, lead. I haven't put all those graphs because it would have taken a lot longer time. But uh, the key thing is, again, as regards this iron uh, reduction efficiency, it was high with typha and feldpites in the initial years. And then gradually, because uh, uh, of uh, the, bas uh, the basal concentration in the plant material uh, started attaining an <coughs> equilibrium level, and thereafter the plant was not able to, it, you know, it reached an equilibrium, so it was not able to take in, uh, uh, any further uh, of any metal uh, metal or metal compound or anything. So again it emphasizes that such systems are very good if we periodically harvest them. And uh, one thing is that, that they are very good. Then is the nickel, again 66%, the typha based uh, system being uh, better than the rest of the system and an overall uh, nickel reduction efficiency of 56%. Here I try to uh, put a um, uh, graph for uh, plant metal concentration. If you see the, in the initial years when the plant was establishing, the plant metal concentration was on an increase, it reached the peak and then it evolved, it came out. So that in itself explains why this uh, reduction efficiency is there. Now coming to the impact of these so treated waters on uh, the crop yield and bigger. Um, literature says that uh, if you apply seaweed water, there is there are enhanced yields. But so far in my three years of study, I haven't found any yield gain with the waste waters. Mm -hmm. But I did not find any decline either. So that could be the reason. That is why people continue to apply waste water for agriculture purposes. So if you look at the yield, if you look at the plant parameters like pasture <coughs> land, root land, and various other plant parameters, uh, that with wastewater and without wastewater are not significantly different. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's the reason why farmers think it's okay to apply wastewater in the field. But if you look at the seed vigor, uh, in the case of the paddy crop, where the volume of <coughs> wastewater which enters into the system is pretty huge as compared to that in the wheat-based system, uh, in, the, in the wheat crop, we found that uh, uh, that uh, the seed vigor with the treated uh, water was significantly higher as compared to the untreated water. So treated no, no. waters are good. No. Yeah. So farmer cannot test the seed vigor, you know. But but no. the treatment does help. That's the message. Now this is not very evident in the case of the wheat crop because the volume which goes into this crop is far less than what goes in the uh, other rice base. We also went ahead and found that is there any impact of treated versus untreated waters on the crop health in terms of disease and pest infestation? And we found that 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 uh, there was a tremendous reduction in the termite infected tillers and the fungus infected tillers in the wheat and paddy when treated waters were used. This was the sewage. So yeah. the treatment is. Can we see that? Yeah. So these are all the treated waters. Oh. This is the seabed water, and this is comparison with the naked ground water. Similarly, so if we average it out, the here I put type of water, pragmatic water, watch water, and the control water. Control means unplanted or the algal, algalized treatment water. So if you just take 
they can own all leverage, assuming that the system, um, that the water is bypassed through all these types of mesocosms, then the disease infestation is also, disease and pest infestation is also tremendously reduced. <coughs> now, coming to the impact of sewage treated and untreated waters on the food green metal uh, hazard, if you look at the, the hazard in our particular case, lead was the key contaminant, as you can see here. And uh, if you look at the sewage water hazard and the groundwater hazard, so this shows because of the continuous application of sewage water at those sewage plot sites, even the groundwater has got excessively high lead concentrations. So therefore, even if you are applying groundwater at that particular site, it is having a lot of lead contamination, uh, lead uh, threats or hazard. But if you look at, uh, uh, if you try to compare, okay, I'll come back to this later to make, the, make my point here. If you compare between the uh, metal hazard between wheat and paddy, forgetting about which metal, overall metal hazard between wheat and paddy, uh, general feeling will be that metal hazard should be more in paddy because in paddy most of the water goes as compared to the wheat. But what we found was this metal <coughs> food grain contamination hazard was more in wheat and less in paddy because of the basic physiology of the plant. The wheat crop likes to divert all the metals in an upward direction. So there is a greater flux of metals from rhizome to shoot to grain. As compared to the paddy, where this flux was, because paddy is a wetland plant itself, so it has learned naturally how to contain all the metal in its root system and pumping only a little fraction into the, into the grain. So that was very interesting that we found that though in a paddy based system we are pumping more waste and so uh, quantitatively more metal should be going, but the food grain metal contamination problems were more in the wheat. And that pretty well you know, explains why cancer is on an eating place. We previously used to think it's more because of water. But now if you see the scenario, the water has contaminated the soil and the soil has contaminated the food. And the food is the one which is more biofamiliar. We drink only a liter or two or three or four of water every day, but we the volume of the food which we take in and that gets bioaccumulated in us. So it's 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 a vicious chain which we are following in church. So that's that was about the hazard and obviously because the hazard threat was more, even if you change the frequency of occurrence, we found that the risks are huge and these risks are more in the Wheat, based, wheat crop than the paddy crop. But if you look at the, uh, 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 the the change in the risk over the two seasons, or over the two years of our study, which we did, we have also completed the third one, but, but uh, that I haven't, uh, didn't get the time to put it in. Uh, what we found is that in the first year, the lead threats were higher in the untreated uh, wastewater irrigated uh, plots as compared to treated, and uh, the iron ones were lower. However, in the second year, they were tremendously reduced. And this was a story both in the paddy and the wheat seasons. Right? So that, in a way, proves that if you discontinue wastewater irrigation with treated water irrigation, not only it improves the soil health, it also improves the crop health, mm -hmm. and so the enhance for the food chain contamination problems. Now, <coughs> to make a point, we also, because next question which we would have been asked was, uh, how do you compare these systems with the conventional STP? Are they more economical, are they sustainable, and all those stuff. So what we did is we tried to analyze all these things. Uh, we assumed the hypothetic conventional STP and compared our experimental vector <coughs> with that hypothetic uh, STP. We asked our engineer to give us a you know, uh, costing of a hypothetic uh, STP, and those values we used subjected them to the energy analysis. So this is not energy, this is energy. Energy is the available form of the energy which is required to produce a product. See, we all are the byproducts of solar energy. And solar energy, so what we did is we, we converted everything into solar equilibrium rather than converting into rupees or dollars which change from region to region and so therefore they are hard to compare. 
So what we did was um, we transformed everything into solar regular uh, joules and then made a comparison between the experimental burning and the conventional SDPs. Now what we found is that the conventional sewage treatment plants have 14 times more resource use than the experimental methods. So that in itself shows if, if more resource is used, the system is not sustainable. Now, uh, and what we found is that of that resource use, the estate is used more of the non-renewable resource. Component of non-renewable resource use is more than the renewable resource use. Uh, we went ahead and computed a number of uh, emergency based sustainability indices like the emergency yield ratio, environmental load ratio, emergency sustainability index, and person renewable index. And what we found is that as regards the environmental wetlands are concerned, they exert 33 times less stress on the environment than the conventional sewage treatment plants. And that the experimental wetlands, or we can generalize and we can say that the constructed wetlands are 70 times more efficient in utilizing purchased resources and consume 25 times more renewable resource than the conventional less. So obvious, these wetlands were 1,500 times more sustainable than the conventional institutions. So the recommendation which I would like to make here uh, at this platform is that this technology is really, really eco-friendly and it is the technology for mitigating global environmental pollution and health problems due to improper sewage treatment. And besides that, it is a very attractive solution for the developing countries uh, particularly with the scarce resource for investment in expensive centralized sewage treatment plants. Now, recently I was in a, a, a eco summit at uh, Columbus, Ohio, and I was interacting with one lady, and she just kind of asked me, "What is the paper you're going to present?" and things like that. And uh, I told about this particular technology. I said, "I'm very happy that you are not doing what we did. You know, we did something which was seriously wrong." Please don't do sewage STPs and all that. This is the technology, modern day technology, which you should be going ahead with. Now, coming to the scarce yeah. resources, many of you. Sorry, if we do that, did you uh, do any? Uh, did you compare? I mean, land as a resource cost. I mean, how much do conventional STPs? Yeah, I was coming to that, that point only. You know, many of us will say that, uh, yeah, constructed wetland systems that means will be more land demanding. In developing countries, we don't have that much of land because of population pressure and all. So you see, that's the reason why we developed a small scale vertical subsurface. There are different types of systems. You can have horizontal subsurface flow, you can have vertical subsurface flow. So what I would advocate is that we should, we should really go in for vertical subsurface flow with some innovative engineering inside those systems. Mm. Now the basic reason to engineer this system is it's a simple, you know, proportionality concept. Higher the land area, higher is the hydraulic, hydraulic retention time, and higher is the hydraulic retention time, higher is the pollutant removal efficiency. Now, how do we get high pollutant removal efficiency? I just proved that we could achieve high pollutant removal efficiency with such a small system. Now, how we can achieve, the, 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 the need of the time is, how we can achieve high pollutant removal efficiency with low hydraulic retention time, thereby reducing the land uh, requirement. Yeah. So, if we, if we, if, if in a vertical subsurface flow system, mm -hmm. what I found is we integrated with a batch flow system. Mm -hmm. So the batch flow systems they increase the virtual hydraulic retention yeah. time and therefore cut down at the land constraint. And there were all, uh, also simultaneously any And I'd just like to end with a note from Mahatma Gandhi. And that is that the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. Thank like you very much for your patient hearing. And I'd also like to inform that uh, uh, we, uh, we are, we've already upscaled this technology. Mm -hmm from 1500 LPD to 2 ml Yeah, we are inside the IRE itself. Yes. We are, uh, what we are doing is we are <coughs> bypassing all Krishi Kun sewage waters through this system, through this system, and then using those treated waters for irrigating the IRE. No wonder.